If you were watching this morning, we first started off and talked about the CWNP updates right after Chuck's presentation. I talked to you a little bit about where IoT is going and how IoT is growing. And it is going to continue to grow. And there are a lot of different protocols that are used in IoT. We literally cover 10 different protocols in the CWICP certification and course. So that puts it into perspective given that we're only covering the most commonly used protocols. Well, one of those protocols is called LoRa for the link layer, uh, LoRaWAN for the full network, and basically it's a long range protocol. And one of the best ways to get introduced to any kind of protocol is to look at a use case of how it might be utilized or applied. And up next, we have Jamel, who I've had the opportunity to work with a lot this year, starting going all the way back to the job task analysis for our new certifications in January, and then throughout product development throughout the year. And one thing I've been able to discover about Jamel is he knows his stuff. So we're going to hear him talk now about Laura in a particular use case scenario. Hello everyone, and um, welcome to this uh, presentation about uh, designing a LoRa network in a mine. Um, we're gonna talk about um, a case study we did with uh, one of the largest um, mining company in uh, Latin America. And this is part of the wireless technology forum um, for this 2020 year. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, today, um, my, um, we have um, a special guest since this is uh, online. Um, presentation and we have the option to invite people. So I wanted, um, I wanted to invite Kelly since um, I think many were missing you Kelly since uh, the last uh, speech about v VR and AR. So uh, welcome Kelly and um, presenting to you today is, um, my name is uh, Jamal Ramul, um, sales engineer and product owner at iBoWave. And um, I hold um, some CWNP certification and I just actually passed the new one about IoT, the CWICP. Um, and I also participated in the in the content. So um, I'll let Kelly um, start. We wanted to do it like some kind of interactive um, presentation um, since we're uh, virtual and we'll try to do it somehow as an interview and let's see how this will work. Yeah, uh, thanks Jamal and hi everyone. It's good to be joining uh, this talk. Thanks for having me on Jamal. Um, so, the, just as a, a general overview on what we're going to cover today, uh, we're going to do a mining overview. We're going to talk about mining 4.0. Uh, then we're going to talk about the use case, and Jamal is going to go into more detail about deploying LoRa in a mine and what that looks like using ID Wave. Um, and then he's going to give you a brief uh, demo to show some of the, the 3D modeling of the mine in ID Wave. And then uh, there's going to be a Q&A at the end as well. So Jamel, um, why don't we just start by maybe you can talk to everybody about, you know, why are mines interesting um, and, and why is this case study so interesting in particular? Yeah, um, so let's talk a little bit about the mining industry. So I'm just going to give a quick overview, uh, not spending too much time on it, but quickly, um, mining is one of the most important um, economic activity in the world um, and each mine um, has its own challenge and usually it's big challenge with complex project in different area and um, what we want to focus here is um, split the mining by mining techniques so we have two uh, type of mining techniques we have with techniques we have surface mining and um, subsurface mining or what what is called underground mining and each one has its own challenges um, so if we talk about surface mining, usually we talk about op open pit mining, uh, currying, strip mining, mo uh, mountain top removal, or when we talk about underground mining, usually it's, it's tunnels, uh, drift mining, slope, shaft, or shrinkage slope mining, or long wall mining. Those are the different type of mines, and each one has um, specific challenges. And um, usually when we deploy a mine, there's always need for new infrastructure. So um, 
um, that is so, needed. Yeah. Jamal, when, when a mining company is, is setting up a new mine, in terms of infrastructure, are they responsible to set up all of the um, telecom in infrastructure and wireless themselves? Or do they generally work with a telecom company, or how does that work? Yeah, so in, in most use case, mines are um, usually in um, undeveloped area. There is nothing, no coverage, um, no wireless service, except maybe satellite like GPS service or something that is not uh, useful for them. Um, they need to deploy like energy, transportation to, 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 uh, to get the, the, the materials and stuff like that. They need uh, storage facilities, but the most important one is telecommunication. So this is our focus today and we're gonna talk about it. And um, usually since there is nothing, no coverage from uh, operator or carriers, um, the frequency are uh, open to be used. And sometimes the government give them permits to use uh, licensed spectrum, um, to use like uh, private, like uh, private LTE in, in license or unlicensed depending on the scenario and they use different range of IoT technologies. Um, they use Wi-Fi, and um, we're gonna review that quickly. And this is what brings us to the uh, mining uh, 4.0. Yeah. And um, this is the new, let's say, generation of mining where everything needs to be smart and connected, and, and, um, and we can see um, what is the investment in that um, mining 4.0. So according to the data we have, uh, from the Global Mining um, Intelligence Center. 61% um, of um, mining companies are using private LTE or private 5G for um, the communication systems in, in their mines. 47% um, are planning to invest more um, into uh, communication equipment in the next two years. And 53% uh, of them are making that uh, a high priority um, within their uh, business. So communication is really important and especially wireless communication. And we're gonna see why. Um, so. That was yeah. my, my question is why are they investing more or why is it so important to them right now? Is there new technology that they're using in the mining industry that requires, I guess, higher quality uh, wireless or, or what's driving that? Yeah, so um, in the mining industry, there was mainly two technology used, um, like um, two-way radio communication, so like for walkie-talkie, which is basic, let's say, um, UHF or P25 um, network. Um, basic modulation is just for voice. And for data, they were mainly relying on Wi-Fi. And, um, but the need is growing, and um, one of the two use cases we wanna talk about is the, um, the autonomous trucks. Mm -hmm. um, so m many mines now are, are starting using that um, because the trucks, they could handle a lot of uh, capacity. Um, they could make the, uh, the volume of the transport um, more efficient so that they increase in, the, in, the, in that volume instead of having man um, uh, driven uh, trucks. Um, it's, they could go on uh, um, higher speed, um, the, the equipment, um, now they're switching to electric, uh, engine and stuff like that need less maintenance and has, uh, more life. Um, so they don't break easily. And also the security is a huge factor because those trucks now they have like a lot of sensors so they could detect if, if there is a human presence or if there's another truck so they don't, um, hit each other and stuff like that. So it's like a smart, um, mining right now. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but this comes with some challenges, right? So um, it's critical that the truck keep operating, right? They need to transport the material. And um, this is for the, the operation, they cannot stop or be broken or stuff like that. And they need to be constantly covered with a network. And this network has to provide high dollar rate, right? And also mm -hmm. sometimes low latency because they need to be connected, um, send their position, take decision where to go and uh, avoid other trucks. And so they need like uh, vehicle to vehicle communication um, technologies and stuff like that. And um, they need to ensure that the accuracy in operation is um, available 100% of the time. So it's, it's critical for the operation of the mine. And the other use case um, that we, we're gonna talk more about today is the smart conveyor belts. Um, so a conveyor belt is kind of, um, 
uh, a mechanical belt, the same that you might have in your treadmill at home or at the gym, um, it, that's transporting um, raw material from the mine to the processing plant. And it can run up to 10 miles across the mine. Um, and there is a need to prevent any incident or damage or fire. Um, and they, they need to reduce the operation cost because if, if there is maintenance needed or replacement or something is broken, then that's, that's, re that's really bad for the, for the business, right? So if a, if a conveyor belt stop working, that is no material transported, the entire mine per, uh, operation uh, will stop for the whatever time that needed to be uh, repaired. So they need um, to, keep, to keep it rolling and um, know exactly what's happening with the belt, um, which will increase profit if, if it keep if it keep working and it doesn't broke or uh, doesn't break or they know exactly when or what is happening with this uh, conveyor belt. So that the challenges are mainly um, there is a long distance between the mine and the processing plant. So how to cover that? Which wireless technology to use, and specifically which wireless sensor network to use, um, since they need multiple sensors here, and um, Geolocation is required, so to immediately and easily identify where are the problems, and um, they need efficient monitoring to prevent any failure. So that that's the challenge for a conveyor belt, and we're going to see that in our use case. Um, so we're going to talk about a project in uh, Latin America where we helped um, a major mining company to actually um, deploy some of those wireless technology and help their operation and make it more efficient and make it, let's say, smart, uh, a smart mine with this mining 4.0 um, era, right? Um, so about the project, um, we had two, um, two areas. So there's the mine environment. It's an open pit mine with some underground tunnel. And there is a, a smart conveyor belt that's um, uh, linking the mine to the processing uh, area where the material will be processed and shipped um, to a, a port where it's going to be uh, transported worldwide. Um, so this smart conveyor belt is critical to the mine operation along with like the, the, the autonomous truck and other uh, maybe um, other monitoring system in the mine and stuff like that. But for this use case, the main concern with the smart conveyor belt. Um, so the, the requirement, what the company wanted to use was uh, WiMAX 802.16 uh, for the autonomous truck. And um, then they plan to switch it to private LTE since it's more efficient and it's just newer generation with the vehicle to vehicle communication is just better. They wanted LoRa coverage for the conveyor belt with um, sensors like vibration, fire interpreter, even smoke detectors. And um, what they needed is a tool to evaluate the different scenarios and technologies um, using like a predictive modeling tool. Um, um, Jamal, why, why all of those sensors? Like what, is, what are they used for in, um, in this use case? Yes, the, the sensor are really important to, um, for example, the vibration to identify if the belt is working. So the, what, the cylinders under, the belt and those cylinders are like vibrating and they have like a vibration rate, right? If the rate go, go higher, meaning there's something, there's trouble maybe coming. So it's for mm -hmm. preventive maintenance, right? If the vibration stops, mean the belt is not working. So they know it exactly when it happened and where it started. Uh, same thing for the fire. Uh, if there's any fire, so it's, it's a problem, they need to detect it. And before a fire happened, maybe the temperature is increasing and maybe there is smoke. So it's mainly to prevent any um, failure and also to locate it. Which sensor started first or which sensor is reporting um, this? And they selected LoRa because of the long range um, that is providing. And we're gonna see actually in the predictive modeling that um, what they assume without predictive modeling was not, was not good enough. Okay. And for that last point, um, they want to evaluate different technologies. So they don't necessarily know exactly what they want to use when they're, when they're just starting out. So they want the ability to check out, you know, what if we um, designed Wi-Fi wi Max here and put LoRa here and then be able to simulate the coverage. Is that, is that right? And they might test out Wi-Fi um, and see what's going to deliver them the results they need. Is that the idea? 
Yes, yeah, so before before we were involved, um, since it was a new development, they were they had the option to choose whatever technology they wanted, uh, frequency they want. Um, it's kind of an, a new project where you have a lot of options. And mm -hmm. they only, we're using like a, a Wi-Fi predictive modeling, so it's Wi-Fi only tool, and it can't be really used in that kind of scenario. So they had to find a new tool and they had requirement. And um, this new tool had to provide uh, predictive modeling for surface mining and for underground mining. So for the surface mining, they needed outdoor prediction for like their typical facilities, let's say the ports where they transport the stuff, the roads, the railways, uh, suburban rural areas where they have like their employees um, um, and their complex, usually the entire complex. And they needed this predictive uh, modeling to work using uh, either like DEM, which are digital elevation models or maps, clutters, which contain all the like um, environment uh, properties, and then building database. So if there are existing buildings, let's say, um, uh, surrounding the mines or the old mine or an existing mine, they needed that database. And um, this outdoor prediction is usually based on geodata, um, geodatabase, so you don't need to model per se the, the, the mine itself. Everything should be loaded from this geodatabase. Okay. And then the use case of the underground mining, right? So you have, uh, okay. you need prediction for the building, um, either um, um, on, on surface or, or underground, if there's any uh, facility underground, uh, you need for your warehouse, for your tunnels, uh, for the processing plant itself, and for the complex and also, so you need interaction between the, the outdoor and the indoor. And right. the prediction needs to use like walls, surface and different materials. And um, in this scenario, you would need to load like CAD files or image and then model the, the building. And all of this for multiple technologies and on different frequencies. So there is no limit. Usually um, most of the wireless technology in private um, uh, enterprise like mining, um, they use ISM bands, which are um, unlicensed band. Um, in Latin America, it's like the 915 megahertz or they use the 2.4 gigahertz. But in some um, scenarios, since it's, it's really um, remote area, there is no cellular coverage, so they, not, they will not compete with um, carriers or operators, then they might use act actually license band. And um, so the, the challenge here is that how to do all of this and using only one tool instead of using multiple tools. Right. And this is where IBOF came in. Mm -hmm. And um, the solution that they selected and um, was a tool for outdoor. Uh, which is our new tool that's coming soon. Um, and this is the iBWave Reach that can do the outdoor modeling and on the surface and has all the uh, clutter data and the geo data. And then iBWave Design, which is the, the, the tool, um, the standard for any underground or any um, building uh, modeling, right? So this was um, the selection and why they selected iBWave and they switch from the other uh, Wi-Fi only tool to, to, to IBWAVE is because of the power of the 3D modeling. They have the option to select any technology and try it um, and do the prediction before actually implementing this technology because sometimes you have different scenario you could use. And um, because of the accuracy, they did some testing, we did POC with them and they were really happy with the results. Um, you, because of the possibility to calibrate your design and make it even more accurate. And overall, it was a better cost benefit ratio. So having one tool that will predict multiple technology on different frequencies. So they know ahead of time uh, which one to use and what to deploy before making the risk of deploying and then doing a survey. And then while well, it's not what they wanted or what they assume. Um, and uh, for the 3D modeling, there were some challenges, right? So let's say surface mining like this one, open pit mine, um, you could consider it as um, different um, surface on different heights and having walls. Um, and then the underground mine is like tunnels, but it's not like uh, a standard tunnel like in, in, um, in uh, subways. It's like a rough tunnel where sometimes it's not really um, um, having perfect like flat surface or something or circular surface or 
um, it's um, it's really challenging actually the, the three D modeling, and this is where we helped. And um, in the outdoor uh, portion, um, it was also needed to evaluate the different elevation and how can they use existing infrastructure. So in this in this example, the um, the mine had two existing towers they wanted to use and put LoRa gateways on top of each mine. Um, and the, with the eye of which they were able to evaluate the um, terrain elevation. And you could see that between the two tower, there is some kind of elevation here in between that might block the signal. And actually the mine on top is actually higher elevations, like on the top of the mountain. And then the processing plant is, is down um, on the valley. And in between there is like some elevation that might block the signal. So the assumption was that using LoRa on 900 megahertz um, will propagate well, will um, cover a long distance. You see here the distance between um, the first tower and the second tower is about 10 kilometers, which is within the range of a LoRa network um, if you use like high spreading factor. But again, um, there is something here to take in consideration, right? And um, we did the predictive design um, I believe reach for the outdoor portion and then I believe design for the underground indoor portion and um, the target coverage was 100% of coverage for the conveyor belt for the entire path. The minimum RSSI was around 95 and I think they lowered it to 100 dBm. The spreading factor they wanted SF7 or SF8 and they needed at least two gateways to have some redundancy. So oh, um, Jamal, what does um, spreading factor mean and um, why seven or eight in this case? Yes, so for uh, LoRa is a chirps uh, spread spectrum um, based technology. So it's gonna um, spread the, um, the signal um, instead of transmitting like with a BPSK modulation or something. Mm -hmm. And depending on the spread factor, um, you have uh, a, a different uh, data rate. So let's say for the uplink SF7 or SF8 will give you like between, um, I think three kilobyte per second to 5.5 kilobyte per second. And um, if we're talking on the downing, this is I think between uh, 10 kilobyte per second to 21 kilobyte per second. Um, so they had a target of, um, of data rate for their sensors. And um, this translate into a spreading factor and the spreading factor mean we need a target of SNR and this is why we have this target of RSSI. Okay, great. And the result was this and um, like expected, um, based on the prediction, the area here has really weak coverage and you see here the blue um, areas, they have uh, lower than 100 110, which is which will not meet the uh, spreading factor requirement and will not meet the RSSI requirement. And um, if they use only the two existing towers, uh, it will not work. So the predictive modeling showed that um, even if it's a low frequency and um, um, high, uh, let's say, um, range of uh, the coverage, it will not work in this in this use case and without the predictive modeling you would you would not see it exactly where you don't have coverage so up mm -hmm. until this area you have some coverage and then here it will it will be spotty and so it's it's like a, an alert for trouble so you know it before even installing anything and this is why they they would need to add another gateway some somewhere and mm -hmm. This is how we help them, and this is why they selected IBWAVE and start using it. And can you, have, uh, yeah. can you show an IBWAVE? Uh, do we have like a three D model um, to show? Yeah, I do have um, one um, one of the um, the project uh, I am able to show you, and uh, I can show you actually in three D. And this is the open pit mine that was uh, modeled in 3D. And you see the tower here on the right. And you see like the different elevation and the different, let's say surface and what is the coverage on each surface. Um, so this was the WiMAX coverage for the trucks. And it shows that 
all the, the different areas, they have really good coverage, let's say higher than NEC 50, and um, which is really good here. And so this is how they were able to um, try different scenario, try different technologies, and now they are switching to LTE because um, this is what um, is used now in the industry, um, especially with the, the new release for, um, for 5G that will allow uh, the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication and stuff like that. So um, that basically what is um, about mining, um, what is um, the different wireless technology in mining, um, that what iBWave can offer, um, outdoor, indoor modeling, different technologies. And I think this use case is really interested, interesting use case. Um, if you have any question, please feel free to ask them. Um, we are available and um, you could also contact us after the, um, the, um, the conference and via social media or um, by uh, Twitter or LinkedIn. And we hope to see you soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Jamel, welcome. I haven't gotten to see you in a little while. Yeah, thank you, uh, Tom. Thank you for having us for this uh, wireless technology forum virtual version. Absolutely, <laughs> uh, and, and I mentioned in the introduction that um, you know I got to meet you in the past a few different times, and then got to spend some time with you back at the job task analysis in January. And then you and I got to work together as well on some of the course material for CWICP. And um, we got to together go through that fun process of trying to dive deep into 10 different IoT protocols. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot and of them. I think we both realized halfway through, we bit off a, a, a very large bite. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was too much, man. <laughs> yeah, it was very but intensive. Good, good experience. Um, there's so many technologies out there. Um, and I think the, uh, the CWICP uh, certification is good. Um, let's say starting point for anybody who wants to uh, learn more about IoT. Absolutely. Um, speaking of many protocols uh, with IB Wave, and, and it does come with different versions, but, um, but IB Wave software, what are the different types of protocols that are actually supported by it? Um, so the, the Wi-Fi version only has um, Zigbee that we added recently, but the full-blown uh, main software with Design Enterprise has almost everything from like LoRa to Zigbee to WiMAX to obviously all the cellular technology. You have ultra wide band. Um, the only th one um, we are missing, I think, is, is uh, BLE, and that, that will be added very soon. Yeah, okay. And so the, the IB Wave Wi-Fi, uh, is, to be clear, supports Wi-Fi and Zigbee, and, and what you've exactly. done recently is you've added in the Zigbee component, yeah. um, which works really well because there are a, a whole lot of environments out there that are Wi-Fi and Zigbee, and that, that's the two protocols that they run. And so um, having a tool that incorporates both of those together is uh, phenomenal for those organizations, for sure. Um, now, the, the question that just came in uh, from one individual was, um, obviously, it's difficult to get signals underground. And the question was, does LoRaWAN make this easier? Um, if you covered it already, uh, they, they do apologize for possibly missing it, but they're, they're just curious about it. And I think that's a, a good question about uh, LoRa, LoRaWAN. I mean, obviously, when it comes to the signal, we're talking about LoRa modulation or FSK modulation with, uh, with LoRaWAN. But um, with LoRa particularly, that's the one that's going to give you more range and penetration. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Easier, I guess we'd have to say than what, right? So let's compare it to something and say, you know, is it easier to get the signal into the mind than Wi-Fi, for example? Um, in terms of signal propagation, obviously LoRa uh, operates on a lower band, so the signal propagates lower. It's a narrower channel, so it could it could operate um, very low 
signal um, level uh, very close to the noise. Actually, it can operate under the noise. It can go uh, all the way down to neg, almost neg 20 dB um, SNR, right? So that's that's not the challenge. Um, so LoRa, it will propagate well. This is why it's called long range. It will go underground, will penetrate building. But there are some challenges if you only rely on outdoor coverage because your indoor sensors will have to communicate back and most of the time they are limited in power. So um, this is why they are indoor and outdoor gateways, right? So um, yeah, it will it will do well if if um, the loss is um, let's say reasonable from outdoor to indoor. But if it's like you go deeper in the ground, then you can you can um, rely on outdoor coverage. You'll have to do something indoor. Yeah, and that's one of the things that um, a lot of people, particularly those that have really only worked with Wi-Fi, and there are a lot of people in the CWMP community that, that that's pretty much it for their wireless experience. They work with Wi-Fi technologies. And um, the people that are now learning about these other protocols, when they learn about uh, LoRa and Sigfox and things like that, and then they find out, so, so wait a minute, so, so you're saying to me that I can receive a signal with a negative SNR value. And the answer is yeah, yeah, you actually can, and it surprised a lot of people. Uh, Jonathan Davis taught the CWICP course uh, at the boot camp just before the conference, and uh, I, I noticed just a little bit ago he tweeted uh, about that fact, and it's a surprising fact to a lot of people that you can receive an RF signal below the noise floor, and that is just one of the big things that indeed is different about some of these different IoT protocols. They all have their unique characteristics and capabilities. Uh, but LoRa that you're talking about here, particularly, that's one of its strengths. And I think, you know, you said it's a it's almost uh, a negative 20 SNR, but uh, uh, the, the the exact number for exam takers would be negative 19.5. That's, yes, that's the number precise, you need to remember. 19.5. <laughs> and that, that's and not, of course, that's, that's not necessarily an exact number in reality. It's just that that's the target that they're yeah. going for. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not unique for LoRa. Um, Spreading um, technology or spreading based uh, modulation do support um, signal coming um, under noise. Um, some cellular technology like the WCDMA or newer HSP, even LTE support um, can work under the noise floor because of some kind of uh, either spreading or coding technology. So uh, that's yeah. the. Uh, Absolutely. And to me, that's a, a, a real important element, even if you're mainly studying Wi-Fi, when you understand that if you have the right modulation, uh, the right coding and things like that, then it completely transforms the ability to receive that signal. And uh, obviously, therefore, even in Wi-Fi, it plays an important role, the modulation and coding. So across the board, it becomes very, very key. Well, Jamel, um, I appreciate you uh, spending some time with us here, direct with the audience. And of course, uh, IB Wave will be uh, talking to us a little bit more later on today, and we look forward to that. But thank you for joining me here for just a few minutes to discuss IB Wave and the protocols it supports and, and some of the fun stuff we've gotten to do over the last year. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for having us, and I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this uh, presentation. Absolutely. Thanks, Jamel.